Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for the introduction. My name is Laura Cook. I work at Warner Park Nature Center. I'm the bird research coordinator there. And um, thanks for coming out tonight. I know it's hard on a dark night to get <laughs> to bundle up and head out. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to go through, give you a little bit of background about the bird program at Warner Park Nature Center. Talk a little bit about um, some things you can do to help birds. And then I'm um, happy to answer any questions. And we can keep this real informal. So if I say something that makes no sense, or if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, so this is, a, this is my office right here. I know how many of you have been to Warren Park Nature Center, but the, this, that's the library and my office is there. So every morning when I walk in, I'm like, I get to work here. It's such a great place. Um, so the first question is, um, why study birds? And um, as we were talking about earlier, first and foremost, we're a nature center um, that happens to have a, a bird research. And so a huge component of what we do is engaging um, all sorts of different um, park visitors who happen to be there, school groups who come. We have um, interns from Lipscomb University and uh, TSU. Um, and lots of volunteers. And so we, the bird program, we, we directly engage with um, close to 4,000 um, park visitors every year. Um, so that's just a huge part of what we do is just that education and engagement. And as we were talking about earlier, um, you know, there's something kind of magical about uh, a kid being able to see a bird up close um, at the we hope maybe changes the trajectory of what they think about birds and what they think is important. Um, but the other thing that we do is, is the research. And so I, I wanted to dive into that um, a little bit today. And so we have at the Nature Center a bird banding station that has been an operation that was started by Sandy Bivens. Um, it was started in 1982. And, um, we ban birds. Banning birds is a, is a method that has been used for um, a, 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 over 150 years. And what it is, it's just a tool to help us study birds. And so we attach like, almost like a little bracelet to the bird after we capture it. And it has a unique number on it that no other bird uh, will have that exact number. And that is all managed through the USGS um, Bird Banding Laboratory in Maryland. So everyone who bans a bird has to have a federal and state permit. And then um, the banding lab sends us the bans so that they can have them exactly the way they want. And our obligation is that we have to submit the data back to them so that they can keep track of that. So if you were to find a bird, um, and, you, and let's just say you know a bird got hit by a car or something, and you notice the band on it, you could go to the bird banding uh, website and submit that number and it would tell you exactly who banded the bird, when they banded it, where they banded it, and then that researcher would also get that information. So, and we do, we do that to help inform, there's all, all sorts of reasons why we ban birds and I can get into that a little bit more, but it's mostly to help us um, understand how populations are doing. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But the, the program, the Bird Banding Station, was launched in 1982. We have a long legacy of mentorship. Um, this woman right here, Amelia Lasky, started banding bluebirds in Warner Parks um, in 1936. Um, she then mentored um, uh, Dr. Goodpasture, um, who was a virologist at um, Vanderbilt University, who then mentored Sandy Bivens, who then mentored me. So we have this great legacy of, um, of women mentoring women um, around avian research. How, we, did, how, how did they, what did, if they banded them back before the internet, what did they do with the band back then? They hand wrote them and mailed them into the banding laboratory. Okay, so if someone found a bird with the band, they knew where it was. Yep. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and, and the, the, some of the older bands actually said where to, uh, they had a place that said send to USGS. <laughs> Um, and so, um, but yeah, the, the banding laboratory was started, I think, in 1920, maybe? It's been, it's over 100 years um, that it's been, it's been there. What are the bands made of? 
that most band, for songbirds, most of the ones that we use are aluminum, um, so they're very lightweight, because um, obviously weight is an important thing for a little songbird. Um, there are some species like northern cardinals that have really strong bills, and we have to use stainless steel bands because we'll just rip those bands off if we don't. But for the most part, they're, they're very, very lightweight. Um, we, I'm the master bander now for the banding station. I took it over from Sandy, Sandy Bivens. But there are four of us that are considered master banders, which just means we have an additional special permits from the banding laboratory saying that we can conduct research and we're allowed to order the bands. I have under me nine sub-permitted um, banders, which means they've gone through all of the training which typically to become a sub-permit usually takes four or five years of apprenticeship in essence, um, which means they can, they can also band as well. And then we have um, really about 75 volunteers. We have a core team of about 15 people at the banding station. We have about 75 volunteers that help us do all of the different projects that the, that the bird program does at the Nature Center. Um, our, our program is a, it's sort of an odd thing. My, my supervisor um, is Vera Roberts, who works for Natural Parks, but I'm fully funded through Friends of Warner Parks. And so the bird program is funded through a nonprofit, but I work, I don't know, it's a weird, <laughs> it's a weird relationship, but it works really well. Um, so some of the, I just want to give you a little background on some of the research that we're doing. So we do, in essence, year-round banding. Um, right now, we're finishing up fall migration. We have one more banding session next Tuesday, and then we'll take a little break over the holidays. And then we have winter banding that happens in January and February. Um, spring banding is April and May. And then we have a, a summer breeding program that runs from May through August called MAPS, which stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. It's a partnership with another nonprofit called the Institute for Bird Populations. That, that does avian research from North America down to South America. And they have very specific standardized methodology and data sheets so that everybody across North and South America who has a map station is contributing the exact, in the, the exact same format with the exact same protocol. And that way they can really compare across the hemispheres. Um, so for, mo for the winter, spring, and fall, um, this is our, we're starting our 41st year of uh, fall banding. In MAPS, um, we, we started, I think we just completed our 32nd year of having a MAPS station. We're the oldest MAPS station um, in Tennessee, certainly, and one of the oldest in the southeast. Um, we also have species-specific research that we do. So all the other that stuff that I talked about before happens at the banding station right at the Nature Center. But then we have species-specific research that we're doing. Right now, we're doing um, our uh, research project on northern Sawa owls. These are owls that breed up in Canada, northern U.S., and then they're considered an eruptive species, which means every three or four years, they push further south during the winter time. And um, sometimes they'll only go as far north as, or far south as Illinois. Sometimes they'll go all the way down to Alabama. And so we, we have been doing um, the owl banding since um, 2007. We've only caught three owls um, in that time. And so if I have baggy eyes, it's because for the last two weeks I've been staying up to midnight. Um, in addition to working all day, uh, trying to catch these little boogers, I'm hoping the cold front that's coming through right now is going to push us out. And so my hope is that tomorrow night we catch our first one. How do you catch it? For, for the owls, we have what are called mist nets, M-I-S-T. Okay. They're 12 meters in length, and they look, they look like kind of a badminton net. And we, we have them put, um, we have them like in a, uh, in, there's three of them that we put out, and then we put a, what's called a callback player in the middle of it. So we, we yeah, it's really loud. And solid owls, if you, I, I should have had a, a video, but they have the most bizarre vocalizations. <laughs> if you can go Google solid owl vocalization, it's just like this toot, 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 like over and over <laughs> for hours. That's what I listen to. <laughs> I'm trying to capture them. I've never heard that owl. 
<laughs> yeah. Most people, it, uh, our hope. Somebody had one in East Tennessee the last week on um, Tim Burn. A solid? <laughs> oh, they, probably Eastern. Yeah. It's probably Eastern. Yeah, they, they, there is a small breeding population, they think, um, in the Smokies. Um, but they certainly will winter, um, winter in that area. Um, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully we'll get one soon. We also do uh, barn swallows. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the steeplechase um, at Warner Parks, but that barn there is a really, really significant barn swallow nesting colony. There's, um, I think, this last year that that location there produced over 180 nestlings. Um, and so we've been for the last five years we've been um, monitoring the nest and banding young there. With the purple martins, we have um, we have a couple of boards um, in the parks, and that's been ongoing for 20 years, looking at nest success and banding the young there. And then, for most, for almost all of these projects, we are contributing to another project. So there's a, a project owl net that we contribute to with the owls. There's a eye naturalist swallow tracker project that we send our results to. For the Purple Martins, we submit those to the Purple Martin Conservation Association. So everything that we're doing, we're trying to also contribute to other research. Um, in August and September, we banned ruby-throated hummingbirds during migration. Um, that project has been ongoing um, for 21 years now. Um, if you haven't seen this, you should come and observe it. It is pretty it's amazing. Awesome. It really is. Um, so these guys, we're, we're banding them, and, and for all these birds, when we're banding them, in addition to hoping that we get what's called a, a recapture, where somebody finds that bird again, we're collecting for all of these birds um, information um, on their morphology, but also on their health. And so we're looking at weight, we're looking at body condition, we're looking at fat. And so for a lot of the birds that are migrating, that's a really important thing to know. And we see throughout the season, when we start in August, um, the birds are usually really skinny, which for a male will be about three grams, and for a female will be three and a half grams. And by the end of September, um, we're catching birds that might be five, almost six grams. They're almost doubling their weight, and they're so fat. I don't know if you guys have hummingbird feeders and observe them, but you know how they're really zippy. And then at some point you'll see one in the fall, and they're like, <laughs> um, the other thing is when they get really fat, and it, you can actually you can see the fat on the birds is they have these uh, white feathers along their legs, and when they get really fat, the feathers push out, and so you can see these hummingbirds that look like they have little pom poms, and those are really fat birds. Which that's, that's good. That's that's what you want to see in the fall because it means they're building up their fat reserves to continue their migration further south. How often do you catch birds that already have bands on them? From other banding stations, not very often. Um, we have we have about 40,000 birds that we've captured, and um, about 15,000 of those are recaptures. Okay. But they're, they're, the majority of them are ours, like 99% of them are ours, which is OK. I mean, we would love to get a recap, what's called a foreign recapture. But by us getting recaptures of birds that we banded, we get to learn things like age. So we have we captured a tufted tip mouse um, last week that is at least 10 years old. Wow. wow. And we've captured it over the last 10 years. We've captured it like eight times or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you get to learn age, it's which they, they, when you, and then you start to, that can help inform, popu there's population analyses that you can do around age. Um, we get to learn about what the timing <coughs> of when they're using the parks and when they're not using the parks. And so like, for example, with the tuft of titmouse, we have some that we capture year round, for this capture around, you know, in all seasons. But then there are some that we only capture them in January and February. So those are birds that are breeding somewhere else further away from the baby station and coming to the nature center um, during the winter time. And so those are the sort of things we get to learn from that. Um, 
And then the last one was um, the eastern, uh, the eastern bluebird. Amelia Lassie, I mentioned, um, she started um, banding bluebirds in the park in 1936. We have the oldest bluebird nest taxonomy project in the U.S. And so there was uh, the person who started it um, in the late 1920s. He noticed the bluebird populations were declining, and and um, part of that was competition with starlings and house sparrows, which are non-native species. And so he said, well, what if I could, they're, they're cavity nesters, as you know. And so what if I could supplement those cavity nester, nesting um, places? And so that's how he came up with the idea of bluebird boxes. And so he put out a notice saying, hey, everybody put up some of these bluebird trails, is what he called them. And Amelia Lasky started the third one in the US. Um, but we have kept it going because we're persistent. <laughs> Um, so we've got about 50 boxes throughout the park that we monitor from March through September and ban the young and capture young. Um, that's a great research project. Um, the, the last research project that we do, um, this one was started in 2020, um, where um, we are contributing to, um, to research where you put um, radio transmitters on, on birds. And so what's happened over the last, um, really the last decade, um, two things have happened. One, before, if you were a researcher and you put a transmitter on a bird, you would go out and you would have to track it within your study area. And then if it went outside your study area, you never knew what happened. Well, these brilliant guys, oops, these brilliant guys up in Canada said, what if we all, what if we all use the same frequency and actually shared information? So they started this project called MODIS. I, if you're interested in it, go to modis.org. It's a great website. So what's happened now is all those, all those yellow dots, this, there's a lot more now. Um, this was probably from about 2018, oh, 2017, um, is that all of those stations are using the, the same um, antennas and receiver stations to pick up the same frequency. And so as a bird gets a transmitter, if it's flying through, a receiver station can detect it, it then shares that information with MODIS. And so it's really, it's sort of his, it's starting to really change our knowledge of birds and, um, and sort of ornithology in general. And they can tell where it came from then. Yeah, yeah, and so and so to be part of the, so to be part of this network, you have to join and say, you know, if you're tagging a bird, you have you have to deploy your bird based on where you put the transmitter on and all this other information. So is there a reason it's so consolidated on the east coast? Yeah, because they these guys started it up in Canada, <laughs> and right now I should have put up a new one. This map right here, this is 2017. It has exploded. The U.S. is just. There, there, there is a huge gap in the southeast. Um, we just, we just um, over the last couple of years, it started off, a few of us, the Tennessee Modus Collaborative, and it grew into the southeast Modus Collaborative. We had a call on Monday. We had 43 people on it. And we just applied for a huge um, federal grant with um, the Northeast and the Southeast, it's a million dollar grant that is going to allow us to put up stations and have research projects um, in the Southeast. And so um, we're all really excited about is, that. Is there any chance to put them on down in South America? Yes, and there are a lot more down in, in Costa Rica, South America. I'm sorry, I should have um, I should have gotten a more recent one. Um, but it's really amazing. The other thing that's happened over the last 10 years is, is nanotechnology. And so, you know, before a red-tailed hawk was the, the smallest bird that you could put a transmitter around, and now you can put it on teeny little things. And so that has really sort of, it's just all of that combined is just sort of, this is a, in the field of ornithology, it's sort of the newest, coolest thing. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about this. We put up a receiver station at the Nature Center. Um, in 2020, um, we received a grant from a private donation. And we have, um, since then, we've picked up several foreign detections. So you were saying how many foreign captures of banded birds? Hmm. Handful in 40 years. With this, we're starting to get foreign detections with not even having to do anything other than turn my computer on the board. So here's an example. 
This is a bird called a, a, a lesser yellow legs. It's a type of shorebird. It was tagged in April of last year. Um, or, yeah, no, this year. I think this was the spring. Um, in Columbia, it was then detected um, in early May flying over Costa Rica. Um, 36 hours later, over Texas. 14 hours later at Warren Park. It, it, we detected it there for about an hour, so we actually think it landed somewhere in Warner Parks and was resting, getting a drink of water before it cruised down further north. And so this sort of information, I mean, this is, you can't get that from Bandit. I mean, you just, you can't. It's just, it's sort of opened up <laughs> um, our knowledge of stuff. Um, so it's, it's, that's sort of exciting. We decided, uh, do you know where you went from there? No. We need more receiver stations. <laughs> we need more receiver stations. Um, we wanted to contribute. We wanted to not just put up a receiver station, but we wanted to have, <coughs> have our own research as well. And so we to do this, to put anything on a bird, you have to apply again to the to the bird banding laboratory for a special another special federal permit. And so our research was looking at five species of thrushes. Um, looking at during migration, very gray cheek thrush and Swainson's thrush, and we're interested to see um, how long they're spending in the, the in the parks during migration. So, uh, and this sort of started because we had had a handful of within season recaptures. So we would catch a gray cheek thrush, five days later we catch it again, and it put on 25% of its body weight. We're like, gosh, maybe Warner Parks is an important migratory stopover. But there's no way for us to prove that with so few with so few you know sample sizes. So that that was our question um, for we wanted to look at because we're banning during the summer during maps with thrush are a species of concern their numbers have declined significantly in Tennessee. So we wanted to get an idea of habitat use in Warner Parks and so maybe that can translate into some sort of man management action. And then hermit thrushes are a bird that breed up in the mountains and further north, and but they winter here down in um, in our area. And so we again wanted to get an idea of, of habitat use for that. So a couple of just a handful of things. I I could give a whole entire two-hour presentation to some of this, but just to give you some, some ideas of um, this is. Um, this is actually, a, this is a Swain's thrush, but this one right here is a really exciting one. Um, this was from a very, which looks just like the Swain's thrush, but it has a rusty tail. But this was a bird that we tag, we don't tag very many, we don't capture very many varies, but this year, this fall we captured five of them at the transmitter sun. And one of them, one of the five, it spent um, four days at the nature center in Warner Parks, and then um, 14 days later, it was, um, oh, this is the, sorry, I'm sorry. This is the swing thrush. Yeah, so this bird here, 15 days later, it was detected by a receiver station in Costa Rica. Um, on its way, there are birds, they spend the winter down in Colombia. Um, so we were, that was really exciting for us to be able, that was really one of our first, like, really true foreign detections of our birds. So of all those birds we've tagged, we've never had one really picked up um, in another um, another country. Um, and so part of what we're hoping to do with all of this, with, with all of those um, those five species of, of thrushes, is to get a better understanding of what's called their full life cycle. And so you know, we know a lot about birds during their breeding. We know not as much about what they're doing in the winter time, and we know even less about what they're doing during migration. And so in order to really help conserve birds, you need to understand that full life cycle. And so that's why that mode of stuff is really helpful and important, because we feel like it's helping to contribute to that. And that's important because, I don't know if you guys um, know about this or are familiar with this, but in 2019, uh, Journal Nature came out with an article that talked about the decline of, um, of birds. Uh, since 1970, we've lost um, 3 billion birds, or about 25% um, of our, our birds. And so, um, again, sort of, this is the urgency around the research and why it's important to do this. 
Well, up here it says easy to identify and count. I can see where it might be easy to identify, but how would you count? <laughs> how would you count? Yeah. Like, how did they get the, these numbers? Yeah, right here it says because they're uh, conspicuous and easy to identify and count. They have reliable records, but how do you count birds? Well, so, so um, there is a whole community of folks who are obsessed birders. And they can, they, there is a, a program through Cornell University called eBird, where if you go out and you're, you're looking for birds, you document the birds, the number of birds that you're seeing and hearing. And so for a lot of, a lot of birders, you don't even need to see a bird. You can just hear it and be able to identify it by vocalization. So and it's community counting. It's citizen science. So the, the research, that, to pull this t together, they used um, historical data on um, called breeding bird surveys, Christmas bird counts, eBird data. It was, it was a massive, a mega data set that they crunched all the numbers together to come up with this. Yeah, Ottawa's got data going back to like 1800s. Yep, yep, from Christmas bird counts. And, yeah. And we, we participate that. We, we, we help, we, we work with TOS to do bird counts, uh, spring migration, fall migration, and Christmas bird counts. So we do that every year. And our results get, you know, at, sent up through the, up to Audubon and places like that. Yeah. Um, they did, they ended up in this um, research, they, they split it out into sort of suites of, of species to get a sense of what was going on. And so you can see, uh, Eastern forest birds overall declined by about 17%. Aerial insectivores like the purple martins and the barn swallows declined by over 30%. Migratory birds, 28%. The biggest one, grassland species, um, have declined by about 53%. Um, so when you start to think about conservation efforts and where you're going to be putting funding towards conservation efforts, this helps to inform some of that. We have access to your slides. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I sent you out to everyone. Sure. In um, all of this right here, all of these graphics um, right here, um, and I'll show you the website, it's called 3billionbirds.org, they're publicly available. So anybody can go and download um, all, of, all of these graphics right here. They want you to. They want you to share it. There are two suites of species that have actually um, have been, have increased in populations. Uh, waterfowl, because um, that's where money has gone. Um, the duck, duck hunters. Duck hunters. And so, I mean, you know, yay for duck hunters, because they put millions and millions and millions of dollars into wetland restoration um, and conservation efforts around um, wetland species. And so the, they're doing great because of that. Um, woodpeckers is an interesting one. <laughs> no one's really sure what's going on with woodpeckers, but they're rocking it. <laughs> um, you know, there's probably, I mean, there was, you know, certainly significant um, forest cut down, and I think there's just been, you know, more of an effort to try to, you know, maybe leave trees alone and more um, dead trees. More dead trees. trees. Exactly. Um, one of the things I love about this, this research is one of the few cases I can think of where these wonky scientists, they put out the wonky science, but they also said, we're going to help make it simple for you so you can actually do something, <laughs> which I love. Um, so they came up with the seven uh, simple actions. So I'm going to go through this right here. And again, all of these graphics are available on the 3 billionbirds.org. So the first one, I don't need to offend anybody, but keep your cats inside. I cannot say it enough. Um, you have to keep your cats indoors. And climate change, habitat loss, number one reason for bird decline. After that, exponentially, the number one reason is cats. Cats kill billions of birds every year in the United States alone. And I know everybody thinks that their little fluffy isn't guilty, but I promise you that they are. <laughs> I, I, I implore you. <laughs> um, so keeping your cats indoors, helping to deal with feral cat colonies and the, the, the spay release neuter thing or the neuter release thing, 
you know, that's great for the cats. It's not good for any wildlife. Um, a cat should never be released back out into the wild, period. Um, I'm trying to work with some local shelters to get, um, when you adopt a cat, that you can make a pledge. Um, the American Bird Conservancy, you can make a pledge that you're, you'll keep your cat indoors. And, um, you know, I know, I before I knew all about this, um, you know, when I was younger, I had my cat it was in and out. I didn't ever think anything about it. I have a cat right now who is six years old, and he does not go outside unless he's in his little catio. And you know what? He's a happy cat. He's fine. People are always like, oh, my cat would be so miserable. Your cat's fine. Yeah. So please, 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 please. Best thing you could do. If you want, if you love birds, this is the number one thing to do. Or at least put a bill on them. If you don't. Um, cats, cats, cats learn. They know. They, they, can, they can stalk without, they can stalk. I mean, they're ambush predators, and so. Oh, I know they are. Yeah. We had a, we had a tenant that had a had a cat that kept indoors all the time, and he ran out. And she said, "Oh, he'll he'll be right back." He was back in about five minutes, and he had a chipmunk already that fast. I, I mean, it's not their fault. They're predators. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Um, another thing, an easy thing to do, easy-ish, is um, to um, purchase shade grown coffee. Um, just shade grown coffee, there's habitat for birds. The, all of the birds, the warblers that we love, go down to Central and South America where all the coffee is grown and they need that habitat. And so there's been all sorts of studies done that show that shade grown forests um, shade grown coffee forests are exponentially better for um, birds. Um, right now, Shelby Bottoms um, sells it. Whole Foods um, sells it. You can. So you don't mean buy a tree and plant it. You're even buy the coffee. There, buy. You're sourcing it from a place okay. where the coffee was grown in a shade grown forest. And so this right here, the Smithsonian um, has. If you go to their site, they've got um, they've got a bunch of resources. But on coffee that has it, there should be a little certificate that will say that it's a shade grown, that it's a certified shade grown coffee. So, um, Birds and Beans is out of uh, on the North Shore of Massachusetts. They're one of my favorite places. Uh, Cafe Christina is another one that they're in Costa Rica. I love ordering from them. It's a little, it's a little more expensive, but it's just something if you want to do to help birds, it's a good thing to do. This one is a hard <coughs> one. Um, <laughs> There's been all sorts of studies that show microplastics and plastics are in birds and how bad they are. Um, there's the website. I don't know what else to say. It's it's bleak right now. It makes me it makes me want to weep. You're finding a fetuses too in us. Oh yeah, it's just so it's not just for the birds. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. So, anyways, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> so you're talking about using less plastic. Using you know, plastic, recycling plastic, I mean, yeah. just trying to reduce plastic as much as possible. Because it has to go somewhere. But plastic, even when you recycle, is, is still going to be plastic at the end of the slide. Exactly. I mean, we just have to stop using plastic. Yeah. Well, we have we have a you know water filter that we use over and over and over again okay. instead of having to use you know. Uh, buy bottled water yep. and you can refill. And, and there are places, there are places that do that. We we were in Montreal this summer, and you know what? There are filling stations everywhere. You you can walk up with your water bottle, and you can go to a filling station that has either sparkling water or non sparkling water, and it's free. You just walk up, boop, you do it. Do it. They're everywhere. It should, should be. be. No one water. walks around with a plastic bottle because there are filling stations. They do a lot more yeah, recycling. Exactly. Like they're slicker yeah. too. We're just so bad about everything like that. Yeah. yeah. I recently saw a program where they found microplastics on the beach at um, Easter Island. I know. Out there remote. I know. It just floats mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, the last thing that they recommend, well, not the last thing, but one other thing they recommend is that is to be engaged in citizen science. And so this is what we were talking about with with eBird. Um, Cornell has Project Feeder Watch. This is a great thing you can just do from your backyard. Uh, well, and kids can do that. We did that at school. Yeah, exactly. Um, Tennessee Ornithological Society um, has bird walks, and so just anything where you can be contributing and getting out and just helping to educate other people about birds is um, 
is always a good thing. We have a friend that lives on Lake James in North Carol up in North Carolina, and he's part of the uh, the park he, where he documents any eagles that in that area. Mm -hmm. And he goes out in his kayaks and because they're they known nests, and he marks all the spottings of yep. the eagles on the lake. We yeah. So them. he's so I mean, hopefully he's debating that something. You know, yeah, he's that's, part of an organization. Yeah, that's there. citizen science, yeah. um, which is great. I mean. Um, so another thing is um, no pesticides in native plants. And so um, this right here, I don't know if you can read it, it says a single pair of breeding chickadees must catch, must catch 7,500 caterpillars to rear one nest. Um, this is a graph. This was from a book. Um, uh, there's an author, Doug Tallamy, um, who um, talks a lot about insects and the importance of insects. But birds that need insects, which are most birds, <laughs> um, how, met, how much by millions their populations have declined. So almost 10 million for birds that are need the insects versus ones where insects are not essential, their numbers have actually increased. So insects, birds need insects, it's their food. But almost all of them need them during the breeding season because they feed the young. They need them especially during the breeding season. There are some, there's a handful of species of birds that can um, that require insects during the breeding season, and then in the winter time, digestively can shift over to seed. Um, but there is not most birds, even in the winter time, really still would like to have some insects that they could get. It's just high protein food. Um, is that average change in the crop? Is that annual or what's the time period? I don't know. I'm gonna look and see. I, I pulled it off. I was just trying it's to find. It is a lot of birds. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a really good question. Um, so, um, more insects means no, um, no pesticides, no herbicides, reduce your fescue lawn into something, this is actually my house, and one of these days I'm going to get a knock on the door by my HOA, because I keep taking out, every year I take out a little bit more of my yard. Um, <laughs> Leave your leaf litter. This is an important thing to do. Um, I, again, the HOA at some point is going to yell at me, but um, I try to leave as many, much of my leaves as I possibly can because a lot of the insects, they're putting their eggs um, on, the, on the leaves. They're there for the winter, and then that's in the spring they're emerging from that. Um, and then also for birds, just having that leaf litter, there's a lot of bugs in that leaf litter, and so it's just... It, Leaving your leaves is a really important thing to do. There was actually something on the 10 o'clock news about yeah, leaving your leaves last night. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, again, it's sort of that, it's that cultural shift of, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you, how, yeah, that's exactly right. Changing our definition of what they did suggest you could mulch it some. You can mulch it some. It does cut up. I mean, if there's insects, yeah. they can. But it's better than you can. Yeah, yeah, better yeah. than putting it in a in a bag and bringing it to the dump. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, around native plants, this is um, this is something that I think is really important. Is that um, Doug Tallamy? I have his books. I'll I'll show you at the next slide. But he's done all this research that shows if you have a, a non-native um, plant, how many insect species it can host versus a native plant. And so native plants have a lot more insects because that's how things evolve. And so for his, from his research that he's done, oaks, especially white oaks, are the, if you want to do one plant, one thing to help birds, plant a white oak tree because they, on average, um, can host um, over 500 species of insects. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, they're declining in Tennessee. Yep. You're yeah. Slow they're yeah. they're yeah. very slow yeah. But he has a whole list. Um, this is these are two books. Um, he has actually I think a new one that just came out. But the, he has if you if you don't want to buy the book, you can go to YouTube and type in Doug Tallamy. He's got a great YouTube video. <laughs> well, a bunch of them. Yeah. How about red oaks? Oh yeah, red oaks too. I mean, so red oaks are. Are they in the white oak family? No. no. They're, they're separate? Red oak. they're, so they're in the separate red oak family. And white oak. So, so I guess, well, I don't know why, but all of the ones that are in the white oak family, supposedly, I mean, I, I'm sure red oak still has 400 species of insects. 
I mean, it's they have a lot more than a ginkgo does. Yeah, first to say about the ginkgo, <laughs> nobody wants to be on a ginkgo tree. Um, well, the issue is that the ginkgo tree is from Asia. Yes, and that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. Privet, bush honeysuckle, ginkgo trees. Yeah, all those things are, are are from Asia. You're not native to us. Yeah. And so, so are a lot of the pests the decimated right. native plants. Stink bugs. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Asia. Yeah, the beetle. And My house is on a 50 foot line near Belmont Boulevard, and I got uh, four oak trees on my 50 foot lot that are, some of them are over 100 years old. Yay. And two wow. Osage trees. And a hackberry that I hate, but I got a hackberry. I'm going to say something about hackberry trees. <laughs> I, I think they should be hacked. No, 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 no. Anyway. no Anyway, I got so I, I, like the I have a lot of leaves. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of berries too. Yeah. Uh, we're just a lot of leaves. I, I was putting <laughs> in those bags I buy at Home Depot and put them on the curb. And I saw a guy out there and they were they were protecting him. And I talked to him and he said Oh, is it okay if I take some of your leaves? And I said well, he's got a 50 foot lot down the street and he is a organic gardener. Oh, yeah. His yard doesn't look like a yard. It's got no grass. It's got all kinds yeah. of stuff growing. And so I said, yeah, you can knock yourself out, you know. And so this year, I said, uh, uh, I'm not going to buy any bags. <laughs> How about you just come down there? That's and right. Pick up the Get a chart. <laughs> to bring it down to your place. Save yourself a lot of work. Yeah, you, you're going to throw the bag away, right? Yeah. You got a little recycle. Right, compost, it, yeah. <laughs> mulching your uh, blueberries and oak is. I'm oh, sorry. Mulching your blueberries and oak leaves is wonderful for the blueberries because of the acid in the oak leaf. Well, I got mean, no blueberries, but anyway. <laughs> well, I know, but I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that, but that, I, I used to gather bags for a friend who had a whole bunch of blueberries oh, I see. up on the trays, and he would he put them around, and it always, never had to fertilize anything, that was always, yeah. So, uh, oh, Tallamy, um, the research that he did, I think, is up in Pennsylvania, and so, you know, oak trees are, that's what he's doing his research. Here in Middle Tennessee, hackberries are the tree. I mean, they are the best tree for birds. They have so many insects. They have they have berries that last a really long time into the fall. Hack, I know. They like, last into the spring. The, the hackberries, the hackberries in Nashville, they are a good, good tree. I know they're messy, but they're good. Well, I'm the woodpeckers <laughs> in school, but that's one of the things I always took kids out to see because of the insects. You yeah. know, the woodpeckers go around the Oh, the sapsucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. the sapsucker. Yeah, well, there are there's <laughs> some trees and bushes that have berries that are poisonous to birds. Some of them saying that. There, there's yeah. Nandina. Nandina. Uh, yeah. Nandina. Nandina. There's a bush. It's, a, it's from Asia. Yeah. Um, they have beautiful, beautiful red berries that stay on. Is it like, is it like holly leaves? Or? No. Um, no, the, the berries themselves um, have signs of. Uh, they have the berries of cyanide in them, and so if um, if a flock of birds like robins or cedar waxwings come down and eat them, they can die. Uh, you see, they have things everywhere. They plant them. They are birds don't tend to eat them. Yeah, dwarfs are the way they are. My neighbor had a whole bowl of them cut off the berries. Yeah, yeah, from the berries because I see cedar waxwings do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My mice ones are not always the smartest. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they like strip of bushes. That's actually what I saw on the thing where I read that you were to Do you know what I'm going to to see? Oh, I watched that Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I just wanted to mention, because I'm going to jump into the one, sort of the, the last set of the seven things that you can do. Um, is that um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, there are places that I think of as being like really birdy places, right? Like, well, you go along the coast and like millions of birds pass through. 
This is a BirdCast is, I love this site. It's by, it's through Cornell. It's a website, BirdCast. I'm not, BirdCast.net, maybe I'm not sure what it is, but um, they, they can give you, they predict, they use weather and, and radar to predict the, num the number of birds that will be migrating through um, three days out. They're forecasting out bird migration. But the, they came up with this new feature under, when you go to the site under migration tools, where you type in your county, and it will tell you how many birds flew over your county that night. And so here's one. I just pulled it up. I did it just a, a couple of hours ago. So what what we've seen since August of this year through today, that's that last stop, Davidson County, we've had 134 million birds fly through our county wow. during fall migration. Are the downtown buildings causing a threat? Yes. Well, wouldn't that be? <laughs> I'm going to get to that. <laughs> isn't that data not consistent with early slides showing the decline of birds? Uh, so, you know, it's it's very well, right? So there are some years, um, it just depends. Last year, this this right here was well below it. Um, it so it just, you know, some years our birds are able to maybe um, mm -hmm. produce a second clutch and have 10 young. And then some years there's a wildfire and they can't even produce a <coughs> set of young. So it just it, it varies from year to year. Um, they fly at night? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to show you this one right here. Sleep and where are they sleeping? So so all birds, um, for all bird species globally, about 19% of them migrate. The rest of them are just they, they live where they live. In North America, 70% of our birds migrate. And of those, 80% of the ones that are migrating are migrating at night. And so, um, so like I was mentioning, those thrushes and looking at migration, those great thrushes that are breeding up in northern Canada are flying at night, they're landing at dawn, they're feeding and foraging during the day, and then if they're going to depart, they'll depart right, at, um, right after sunset. And they fly they, when do they sleep? Um, well, they, they don't a lot. That's part of the issue. That's my that's why migration is such a really challenging time for them. Well, so they can take a little way. nap if they can find a safe place without cats with shelter, where they can take a little nap during the day. That's when they're that's when they're doing it. So there's light pollution too. Right. Yes. Yeah. Da -da. <laughs> <laughs> so so some of the research that's happened over the last um, few decades. Um, has shown that, you know, the way birds, because they're migrating at night, they're using a lot of different cues to help them know where they're going. Um, some of it is magnetic, some of it is stars, but um, what they have found is that urban areas with a really, with, a, with this sort of urban glow, they are attracting birds. So if a bird wants to go, you know, from point A to point B, but oh, look at this bright area, they tend to be attracted to these large areas. This is messing up with their, their, their navigation system. And so what happens is we're attracting them to these larger urban areas because of the light, and then they're slamming the buildings because they're flying at night. <laughs> um, and we'll get into that a little bit. Nashville ranks 24th in the spring and 17th in the fall for the worst artificial nightlight out of 125 cities. So Nashville, not doing great on light pollution, which if Theo gave that uh, dark skies probably talked a lot about that. So a group of us, um, last, last fall, I don't know if you guys remember, it was in the news. Um, there was a huge, during the 9-11 um, thing in, in New York where they put those big lights up, there was a, a real catastrophic event happened where these birds collided with buildings and they died and it made national news. And so this one woman who lives here in Nashville named Jackie um, kind of reached out to a bunch of us sort of in the bird community and said, okay, like, what can we do? There's this whole campaign about turning your lights out. Nashville's not involved in this at all. There are other cities like Chicago and, and Boston and other places that are doing these lights out. 
can't we do that? And so we formed this informal collaboration and formed a group called Bird Safe Nashville, where the first thing we were going to try to focus on was trying to get something about, about the light issue during migration. So we have a website where we are asking homeowners and businesses to make, to pledge that during migration, so from March to May in the spring, and then August to October in the fall, if you can, turn your lights off. Simple as that. Like if you don't need the light on, turn it off. There's been all kinds of research, and in, they've done research up in Chicago where they'll show even one in a in like a you know a, a high rise area, one lit window is enough to attract a bird to that area. Or at um, least close your blinds. You can close your blinds. You can have downcast lights. So instead of having lights that are going up, they're downcast. They could be on timers. They can. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we can be doing. What about the dark skies initiative that was passed with Metro Council? I know that it applied only to new things. Yeah. And not much was said after that. Yeah. And that's that's something that we're hoping to to incorporate into this. So we did get a resolution passed around lights out, saying that well, this is a little different. This was this was that the, the city of Nashville has a resolution that we are going to do our best <laughs> uh, for lights out, and that's about as far as it's gone with the city. We have um, a lot more work to do on it, but at least they were supportive of that, so that was great. Um, we have gotten a handful. I think we've had. Um, we've sort of we've targeted some of the worst buildings in downtown Nashville. We've had eight buildings sign on, pledging that they'll do this. Bridgestone was the Bridgestone Tower building, not the arena, was the first one, which they got a ton of blasts, um, was the first one um, to agree to do that. And so, and then we have about 100 homeowners that have made the pledge. And this is something that we're hoping before spring migration, we're going to be doing a really big push to get more people to sign on to that. What about the Batman building, which I technically work in? Yeah, what about that building? <laughs> I, know, I know our company, our floors have motion sensor lights, so they're, they've got to come yeah. on at night. They're off at night unless somebody walks in, like the plane crews. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's sort of, those are the sort of things that we're, and, and there's all this stuff that talks about, there's energy savings around that too, right? I mean, it's like why your parents said, turn the lights off if you're not in the room. I mean, it's a it's an yeah. easy thing to do. Just turn the lights off if you're not using them. So the Batman building is I, I don't know, I'll have to check and see if they have. I don't have any clout, I can talk to our okay. the, the last thing I wanted to mention around windows and collision is, so you do have this issue during migration and the lights and all that, but the reality is how many people here have been sitting there and you heard a, hear a large squack? Has everybody heard a bird crash into a window? Mm -hmm. You've never had that happen. I recently had a hawk in my, and it's a low dark, window. I thought it was a basketball in my house. And he, he lived, but he stood outside looking at my window like <laughs> days yeah. for about five minutes. It was yeah. sad. I've had yeah. one kill it kill hit my car, but not, yeah. not any windows. So 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 actually for for collisions like that, homeowners, everybody thinks, oh it's these big skyscrapers that are killing all these but if collectively if you think about how many of us have had birds hit windows and you think about collectively all of the houses, homeowners are actually a bigger problem than the, than the big skyscrapers. Well, the other thing too, even with the skyscrapers, is usually it's the first three floors that do the most damage. That's exactly right. And part of the reason for that is that, you know, if you think about, you can even see it here, we have vegetation around our homes, right? And, and, and it reflects it. Reflects it. And the bird has no concept of glass. And so they, they see the reflection of a tree or a shrub, and that's what they're headed towards. Um, and so that's part of the part of it, too. But there are things you can do. There's a great um, organization called the American Bird Conservancy. They have a fabulous website that has all kinds of resources on all of the threats that I just talked about. Um, but they have great resources. So this is the, the library where I work. and so. We have a bird garden right there, and I was like, well, we have to do something about these windows. And so this is just something, it's these, you, it's these little dots, you can apply them, that you clean the windows, and then you stick them on there. And um, 
The key is to have them be just two inches apart. Um, because if it's bigger than that, the bird can fly, you know, they think they can fly through it. But what they're seeing is these are these are have some ultraviolet reflectives so the birds can see those. Um, and so we are we are trying to encourage as many people as we can to put these on um, on their windows. We had a big renovation um, of the big learning center and they had to replace the roof and all the windows in the atrium and I was like we have to we have to do something about this and so before they installed the windows we had a company a professional company called and came and they installed um, these bird friendly stripes on it um, and we have not had any we used to have so many collisions in those up those it's like a second floor windows and we haven't had any since we've done that they also make where do the you bird get friendly glass too if you, you, can purchase, you can purchase you can purchase it's expensive. Yeah. So there's retrofitting and then there's purchasing, like added through construction. What kind? What kind of windows are they? What are they called? Bird friendly. Just bird friendly. If you type in bird friendly windows, or if you go to the American Bird Conservancy, they can tell. They have whole things about new windows, new construction, or if you're re if you're doing a renovation and you want to put in and buy these windows that. And there's all sorts of things you can do. I mean, you can you can etch the glass. <laughs> You can, um, it's Shelby Bottoms Nature Center. They just take paint and they like, kids have like a little hand friends. It's usually doing anything to break up that reflection. Put up uh, oh. the, 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 yeah, the stickers. <laughs> the stickers. Yeah, stickers. I don't have much luck with those. Well, it's because they have to be two inches apart. Yeah. So you can see here, I don't know if you can see this, right, right up here, those, yeah. those are, the, we did stickers. And then we did the dots everywhere else. I don't know if you can see it up there. And then down here, the, the, up there. See, the, see the birds right there? Oh, okay. So yeah. those are just, we did yeah, the birds. Kind of all, yeah. yeah, and then here, this is a tape. It's called kaleidos kaleido kaleidoscape tape, I think. And so this, again, is a reflective thing. And so we tried to just make it look kind of pretty so it wasn't just a bunch of dots. People, I think, you know, when you look at that, you're like, oh, I do not want that at my house, and, right? But I'll tell you, when we first put it up, and I looked out, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is not, there's dots everywhere looking out the window. I don't know about this. But your brain does this amazing thing. I swear, within an hour, my not brain it said, ignore that. And I walk into that building now, and I don't even, if I'm not thinking about it, I don't even see those dots. My brain has just decided to look at the birds. <laughs> it's really it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Is there a logic from the distance to the top to the start of the dots and the bottom to big gaps? So there's actually not gaps. There, you can't see it, but there's tape there, this ultraviolet tape called the light. Both up and down? Yep. Okay. Yep. And so there, that all that whole window, there is something, something every the two inches. There. We just tried to make it look. Oh, we were trying to so show examples of things you could do. Well, you have a big sliding glass door. It's a lot of surface area. Yeah, you just, it has to be two inches. If, and so if it's, if you know, if you've got just a couple on there, that might not be enough. And the thing is about, like the hawk you said, I think a lot of times some of the research has shown that, um, you know, when a, a bird collides with the window and they sort of sit there really dazed and some people pick them up and keep them warm and then they fly off. The problem is, is a lot of times they do have internal damage, and so they're like, "Oh, well, the bird was fine." It's like the research is like, maybe not. You can't. No, there's nothing you can do about it. So last last month we had a gentleman here talking about. Um, well, his topic really was the passive solar homes, but he did bring up the passive solar, and I've been fascinated passive solar since I first read about it like when, when I was in college. So my husband was trying to convince me to move. He said, I'll build you a passive solar home. So now I have this beautiful passive solar home. It's cozy and warm. But I do have a problem with the birds because we have all the glass in the south facing side. And I've tried all kinds of things. Yeah. And uh, one thing I did find recently is the window alert people, they I now have a thing, it looks like a tube of, a uh, small tube of uh, shoe polish. Mm -hmm. And it's a clear liquid that you can put on your windows. Yep. But it's still tough because you have to, 
it wears off, just like the stickers wear out. Yeah. The, the, the other thing too is um, screens work great. Screen. Yeah. If you have yeah. exterior screens, our windows came with interior screens. Yeah, if you have yeah. exterior screens, that's enough. It's just enough for the bird to kind of hit it and they can kind of bounce off of it. Um, and so exterior screens help as well. But the, the American Bird Conservancy has a bunch of different options for things to do. We didn't we did realize that about the screens. We didn't learn that until yeah. we bought our <laughs> Yeah. So I think that's everything that I have. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions or dive into anything else if you guys have any questions.